Now, when I'm breathing this water in, it wasn't bad going in, but when I breathed it out, now it's warmed up in my lungs. That mm. warm water, I was going, ah, ah, ah. Brett, you're killing yourself. No, I. All right, Brett, three, two, one. My beautiful friends, I have the most incredible life story, traumatic as it is. Um, Brett, Archibald, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you for making time. I really appreciate it. I find your story just absolutely incredible. And I hope that what we share today really um, ignites any of those that are personally dealing with trauma or have dealt with something in the past and uh, I know that um, in your vocation today you assist people with that I mean firsthand you've had the most traumatic experience and I thank you for being on here and anything you share uh, but before we start um, so both Natal boys how cool is that China <laughs> <laughs> And I know you went to Westfield and Natal University, but before that, uh, Brett, where were you born? I was actually born in, in Durban at um, St. Augustine's Hospital. Lived in Westfield my whole life until the age of 26 and then hived off to Johannesburg for 10 years and then hit the world circuit. I went to London, I went to Hong Kong, I ran a big business that we had 19 offices across Europe, Middle East, Africa, India, Asia, Pacific, Japan, and Australia. So I was a traveling Wilbury, but loved it. In the hospitality industry, hotels and resorts, just epic, epic 30 year career. That was just mind blowing. Amazing. It's, it's amazing. And I always say, you know, the quality of life and consciousness, uh, Traveling does so much for that, gives you so many more layers, tasting different cultures and smells and experiencing. It's uh, just different countries. It broadens, broadens you so much as a human being. Um, and so, you know, just for, uh, just for people to know, Brett, um, that was all a beautiful career. You had, you had no idea what was about to happen to you. I mean, you, you, you fell overboard. All right, so I, I, I'm based in Bali. I've been living there for a couple of years now, and I'm very familiar with, with that ocean. People sometimes think, oh, it's a calm little fishies and snorkeling and all that. But the surf <laughs> pumps and the belly of the ocean in Indonesia can get, can get hectic at times. Um, so, yeah. so just to set a context here, you fell over. It was like after midnight, uh, stormy waters, Indian Ocean, um, and literally by yourself alone, literally had to stay buoyant for 28 hours, all right, with uh, sharks circling, seagulls trying to have, have a go at your, at your eyeballs and all that type of stuff. Um, just absolutely incredible. Now, the first thing that I want to ask you is before you even got into that, at school and that, were you a, um, were you a sportsman? Are you naturally fit per se? Uh, and were you before you even went on this, this surfing adventure with a bunch of mates? Brett, I played very average sport. I loved surfing. I started surfing at six and surfed my whole life on the Durban beachfront. Uh, played hubcaps rugby, played, played quite serious squash. But, you know, I, for, I can honestly say after I finished school, I played rugby for Crusaders alongside... Dickie Muir and some of the big names that, that um, Crusaders produced, then went to Collegians for a few years. And then I got so involved in my career, I went off to Joburg, packed on the pounds. When I got to London, the Heathrow injection got hold of me. I was a real tubby, tubby, <laughs> <laughs> pork pies and, and lots of beer. And interestingly, I... I do crazy things. I, I work for a charity, so I try and do fundraising things by doing crazy sports events. So I, I was very fortunate before I went on the surf trip. I'd done a cycle race called the Cape Relay in Cape Town, which is 
it's just a beast of a race. It's 200 Ks a day for five days. And then you cycle from uh, Franschhoek into Cape Town. Have one day of rest and the final day you do um, the Cape Argus cycle tour, which... What, the last easy. leg? The last leg is the Cape Argus. So that's yeah. a monster. That's like baby school, the Cape Argus. <laughs> Was that your leg. last leg? Eh? Wow. That's the last leg. Five days of 200 Ks a day. It hurts anyway. Eish. Eish. I was very fortunate. My whilst I was still a really chubby fellow, my legs were strong, my lungs were strong from yeah. from the cycle race. So mm, that mm. certainly I was blessed to to spend some time with Professor Noakes, and he did. Although he only gave me 12, 10 to twelve hours when he was interviewed on the radio, he did say that that because I I'd been re reasonably fit from that cycle race, that my with my legs strong and my lungs strong, that certainly worked. Mm, but mm, I can tell you, mm. when I fell overboard, Brett, it was 2.30 a.m. It was possibly, probably the mm. worst storm in 36 years in the Mentawi Straits. 100 kilometers out to sea. I'm a skipper, been in the ocean, been on boats my whole life. When I came around, I, I, I blacked out and, and fell overboard unconscious, came around in the water to see my boat probably 50, 50 to 75 meters ahead of me. And I knew oh. without a shadow oh. of a doubt where I died. I mean, the waves mm. were, I just got pounded. I mean, the waves were just smashing me, smashing me. I knew I was going to die. I just didn't know how or when. And that was, that became my whole, just this constant questioning. How am I going to yeah. die? How am I going to die? Mm, mm, mm. You know, people, I, I can only imagine in my wildest imagination the fear when you see the boat like drifting off. It's dark and you know nobody's going to notice it. And the worst thing, so you say you fell off unconscious. So um, to, just to take a step back, uh, there were reports that the boat and a lot of you had had severe uh, food poisoning as well. And uh, obviously in the rough seas, the combination must have been a nightmare just to be on the boat, never mind what was about to happen, right? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I'd woken up at one o'clock in the morning, it was just after one, and I was sick buddy i went into the head of the boat and i sat there on the toilet with my head in a basin diarrhea and vomiting like i've never had in my life i remember at one stage i had a little there was a little handheld shower and i was just washing i was just vomiting this black bile and we'd all we'd all shared pizzas and you know in bali don't eat nasi goreng and noodles bro don't eat pizza we ate these pizzas. We found out they'd been in the sun for the whole day before they were cooked. They were horrific, but we were so hungry. I remember tasting this thing and thinking, ah, there's something wrong it's with dodgy. it. So we ate it. Dodgy pizza, yeah. But we ate them, and six of the nine of us were violently ill. They were just, they were just guys being ill all over our boat. And I'd gone to the head of Vinci. I remember thinking, I have to get fresh air. I went out to the back of the boat and found a mate of mine. He was lying there. He had a bowl in his hand. And he was actually vomiting blood. So I got him to the top deck and said, buddy, we've got you. He just said, please find out how long we've got to go. And that's why I walked into the skipper's cabin, looked down, saw the time, 2.20 a.m. And I realized I'd been vomiting and diarrhea for over an hour. And I still, and so I drank a Coke. I tried to get him to drink a Coke. And then drinking that Coke, got me vomiting again. And I went to the railing and I was holding on the railing, started spewing. And I remember just first one, second one, third one. I thought if I vomit like that again, I'm going to black out. And I actually blacked out. I mean, mm -hmm. a doctor, American doctor came a couple of days later to surf with us. And he said, you wondering how you blacked out because I could not fathom mm -hmm. what had happened. He mm -hmm. told me it was my vagus valve. You know, when you're being so ill, it just shuts off the oxygen to your brain. And that's, Shut off the oxygen to my brain. I went straight over the railing and came around in the water. That is terrifying, brother. I I, <laughs> I, I, I acknowledge the fact that you have the courage and the resilience to even see through that, even trying to survive because your options are gone. I hear you straight away. I know this is the end of the journey for me. You're a skipper. You know, it's like a pin in the middle of a haystack on like 50 farms to find that pin would be almost impossible, especially with the currents there. Those currents change all the time. They're getting manipulated off the islands, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I can only imagine. 
uh, so, so, so then, then you, you fell off and um, 28 hours in the water, Brett. So I, I'm, a, I'm a long distance swimmer. I do the Robben Island to Cape Town. It's two hours, 27 minutes, right? Minus 18. To even think that I'd still be in there for another 16 hours, given the water is cold there. But when I do warm water swims, I actually battle worse than if it's in cold water. Um, uh, just with the hydration and the heat and everything like that. And we in Indonesia, how did you cope with that fluctuation of, of just your body, weak as, weak as can be? Now you've got to tread water for that long. Um, and, uh, and I know that the sea is full of jellyfish. They, it's full of, uh, you know, um, you, you can get so sunburned sitting out there. Uh, you had an experience with the sharks circling you, seagulls trying to knock your, knock your eyes out, just going for them. And, um, and you just stranded in the middle of the, at that stage, right? What were you thinking? You know, the first thought, and, I, and I'm a very pragmatic human being. I knew, as I said, 100 kilometers out to sea. No one had seen me fall overboard. No boats were around. You know the Mentai Straits. It's not a shipping mm. channel. It's only mm. supply boats and surf charter boats. So I knew there weren't going to be boats while the storm was raging. And that storm mm. raged. I tell you, I, I can't even describe the size of that ocean. Mm. All I focused on, and it was so weird. I, 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 the first thing I did, I put my hand on my wrist. I counted and I realized my pulse, I, I mean, obviously not accurate, mm. but my mm. Was over 180 beats a minute. I remember thinking it's just adrenaline, you got to calm yourself down. Yeah, broke my neck in '96, uh, tequila induced diving out of a three story building into a swimming pool. So I've done quite a bit of yoga, and I just thought, just get onto yoga mantra, calm yourself down. When the adrenaline runs out, you're gonna sink. Yeah, so I, that's what I did. I mean, it was pitch black, I'm just treading water. I kept getting pushed under by the waves because I couldn't see them coming, so I just did breaststroke. I pulled my arms and kicked my legs and I counted 1001, 1002. So I could see the wave dive under it, keep going like that. But I have to say it was 28 and a half hours. And that half hour is the most important because I actually <laughs> drowned myself. There. Try to end it. Exactly. I had to exactly. Ex exactly. So now the physical pain that you were in, was there, was there a lot of physical pain? Because people don't realize that. It's not just treading water. It's not just trying to get your mentality right, as you say, in a, in a yoga state. But the physical pain as well of treading water for so long as well and the fear at the same time. You know, interestingly, I was never scared. I, and I think mm. it is because I've been, spent a lot of time with my life coach, and she said, because you accepted the fact this is where you were going to die, you weren't mm. scared. And it became all about the question of mm. how I was going to die. Mm. And I kept getting mm. angry, which was that, a good emotion because it made me fight, you know. Mm. But you talk about pain, brother. I, I cramped. I cramped at one stage. My, my glutes and my hammies were so cramped that my ankles were touching my butt cheeks. And I was trying to get yeah. my legs straight because when I was in that state, yeah. I couldn't yeah. kick. And my yeah. hands kept cramping. My hands would go into balls like oh, this. Man. And with them, I couldn't swim. So I'd actually have to force my fingers. At one stage, mm. I thought I'd snap the tendons in my fingers. But I just had to get my hands flat so I could swim. And, it, and you know, the body's a weird thing. I still have, often at night, I have the same cramps. My hands cramp and my, mm. my, my, my glutes and my... Mm. Uh, it's just terrible. Mm. terrible. Mm. But that pain, I mean, but also... Mm. The, you know, Tim Noakes said the pain also was one of my saviors. It made me so angry mm. that I would fight the pain and that mm. would get me going again mm. and my adrenaline would pump and off I'd go. Mm. Mm. Now, like you say, pain, I mean, that, I got stung by blue bottles like you can't believe. And mm. I actually welcome that. The jellyfish, I mean, I, 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 when I got out and <laughs> when I was rescued by the Australians, I was just covered in these welts. And uh, I remember saying to the, the pain went away in the water, but when I got out the water, these welts were, and I remember saying to the, oh, Doris, I said, Doris, you got some cream for this? And he said, mate, you've been swimming for 28 and a half hours. Hard in the F up. I said, okay, let's go to surf. Have you got a board to lend me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the pain, but the pain in an interesting way helped save my life. Huh? You know, and, yeah. and I gave up. I'm not, I'm not proud, but I gave up yes. eight times. Uh, yes. But 
every time I gave up, I was just really, I was saying, God, please take me. I cannot carry on. Mm. Something will happen. Jellyfish mm. happen. Blue bottles mm. happen. The sharks happen. The seagulls happen. Mm. I started hallucinating. I mean, I mm. saw stuff that was so real. But it wasn't, you know, Tim yeah. Lakes explained that the mm. dehydration and swallowing so much mm. salt water. Mm. When I will tell you the worst pain of anything was mm. because the salt, I swallowed so much salt water, I, my bladder was full. I had to release my bladder. Let me tell you that peeing warm salt water through your urethra mm. Mm. is like taking a burning hot rod and shoving it through your Shoving it straight up. Oh, sh and very often I fell asleep and I had to wee and I'd wee and the pain would wake me up. I but mean, it's you, brief. <clears throat> yeah. You, you say that there was a stage where you actually surrendered, right? You said, this is it. Take my life. Uh, I read your book a couple of years ago. I read it from uh, uh, one weekend. I read it from one page to the other, which is, which is quite astounding for me. I'm not a big reader per se, but I was gripped by the story. And... Um, so you surrendered. You were actually swallowing water as, uh, to 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 drown yourself, or go underneath as deep as you could and try and drown yourself. I mean, at that stage, uh, did you even were you even conscious that you were making those decisions, or were you just absolutely out of survival fear? I, I got to give up. I can't carry on anymore. It was, a, it was a, the most radically conscious decision because I'd swum through the first night, the whole of the second day. That whole night, I never thought I could make it through another night. The next morning, the light, it's got light. I see this boat coming my way. It's a little Indo fishing boat. They stop. They, well, they didn't anchor. They stopped for a while. I thought they could fish there for the day. I started swimming to that boat, and they sailed away. And let me tell you, uh, I just knew I was swimming so hard to get to that boat. My entire body just cramped, and I just said, I, I, I've got no reserves. And I... I tried to put my face in the water and fill my lungs with water and I couldn't. Mm. So I swam down. I remember lying on my back, spread eagle. Mm. And I remember looking up and you know how clear the water is. Mm. It was like mm. this mm. magnifying glass of the most mm. beautiful day. And mm. I just breathed water. And it was so radical because I breathed water right into my lungs. But interestingly, breathing the water out during the night, my tongue was so swollen and, and I started mm. getting Hypothermia set in, which is another mm. crazy thing. It's mm. irreversible. Mm. And I bit massive chunks of my tongue off. So my tongue was bleeding like mm. mad in my mouth. So when I'm breathing this water in, it wasn't bad going in, but when I breathed it out, now it's warmed up in my lungs. That mm. warm water, I was going, ah, ah, ah. Brett, you're killing yourself. Another one. Ah, ah, ah. And the third time I did it, I remember just going, you stupid idiot. What are you doing? It's a it, the sea was so calm, Brett. It was like mm. a duck pond. I knew Incredible. they were going to be fishing boats. Mm. I knew people would be looking for me. And I thought, fuck, boy, fuck. You're going to be rescued. Mm. And then I saw this little cross. Yes. That cross. And I yes. said, shove that where it fits best. I'm tired of these signs. And I'm watching this thing. I wasn't even getting excited. I'm just treading water. And I see this cross. And it's coming closer and closer. And going, am I hallucinating? What is this? And then suddenly I, I realized it's the mast of a yacht. Then I saw the bow. Then I saw this guy on the bow and he was pointing left and right. Oh, like, man. What are you doing? And then they sailed right up and I just screamed. Oh, that's great. great. I asked them sure. if they heard me. They said, yeah, mate, we thought there was a wounded buffalo in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Aussie, eh? Um, but I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, just speaking into that, I remember in the book you were saying like, you saw this cross. Was this like Christ coming to save me? Was this yeah. a sign yeah. from, 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 from a religion? What was this? I mean, you were so gone. You just had your mouth and your nose above the water, That's hoping for the best at that stage, surrendered, given up, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I was ready. To, I just wanted to go. I couldn't take the pain anymore. I couldn't keep the cramps at that stage. Mm, were just mm, so mm, mm. I'd, like, I'd have to grab my toes to try and straighten my legs to get mm. cramps in my hammies away and I'd just sink and I'd go down mm. like a stone mm. then I had to let go and mm. fight and as I'm kicking back up the cramps mm. would come again oh. what a miracle right uh, an Aussie guy what, what I know of about it people were trying to pinpoint where you are working out currents brought out a big map and this guy went out of his way to literally get stuck into trying to figure out where you are. And, and we, to, you're a skipper, but to try and 
even explain to people how hard that would even be is a miracle to find you, right? Isn't it so cool? I mean, we we go to, we, we you know we have this thing about the Aussies and rugby and all of this, and here this here this yeah. hardcore Aussie dude comes to the rescue at the most important time of your life. Uh, do you still stay in contact with him? Um, it just, yeah, just I, yeah, I stay in contact with him. I mean, his name's Tony Altrington. His nickname's Doris. He's one of the pioneers and founders of the Mentawis. He is the wildest, hardest man on this planet. And you know wow. that he. His best friend died the morning I fell out of ball. And he was gutted. He knew he was dying. He had cancer. He was heading back to Australia to be with him. And he'd gone into the Port Authority to register their boat out. When you leave uh, Indo, you sail across, you've got to leave, register out and register in and vice versa. So he, his little cap, his little uh, deckhand was signing the, their boat out. And they were going to start heading up to Iceland's last surf and then across back to Padang. And he heard that our captain telling the Port Authority I was gone. And he went running back and he said, Doris, 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 there's a sapphire overboard. And Doris just turned to his crew and he said, guys, I'm jumping in the tinny. Now, you got to know, it was the worst storm. He jumped in their tinny, oh. their, their, their tinny and, he, and three guys went with him. Two doctors, well, a doctor, a chiropractor guy is also a doctor and a lifeguard. And the four of them went out at midday that day and they were... At eight o'clock that night, the Port Authority called them back because they were jeopardizing their boat and their crew. Mm. And he went, they got back to the boat and they said he was like a man possessed. He just walked up and down on the Baron Joe saying, I should have found him, I should have found him, I should have found him. And he happened at midnight, he happened to go and take a pee overboard and he looked down and he saw a bunch of coconuts going along and they were going the wrong way. So where they've been searching, he knows those oceans. Like you say, the currents have changed. Mm. So I should have hit land, but the current turned and I was now going back out to sea. Oh, man. So when he saw those coconuts, he went, oh, my God, the currents changed. He's on the current. And he started throwing a coconut into the water every 10 minutes. And the next morning when they could go, 4 a.m., he put a guy on the bow and he said, you just look for coconuts. I'm following the coconuts and we're going to find them. We'll either find the body or he'll be alive, but we're going to follow those coconuts. And everybody else was going where I should have been, and he followed his coconuts and literally sailed straight up to me. Brett, amazing. Eh? Absolutely amazing. Eh? Yeah, I just want to take this opportunity right now to send him love and gratitude, man. Saving a sapphire yeah. and your life so beautiful. Uh, t tell me, the the have you recovered from from that emotional scarring i mean it's a huge thing in one's life and, and and a lot of people it's not about being a tough man or anything but this is an experience that has engaged your life to the absolute core of life itself have, have you have you worked on yourself uh, i know that uh, that you've actually turned this unfortunate situation or your mess into your message to help people that are dealing with trauma in so many ways i acknowledge you for that but have you recovered? Look, I can tell you the first year after this happened, I was complete, a complete mess, Brett. I, my brain fried. Every time I saw the ocean, I used to break down and cry. I'm very blessed in life. I have a life coach that I've worked with for the past 24 years, uh, 25 years. And I've had, I've got an incredible mentor who, and I just went straight to them. You know, I, I, I knew I was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and, I started working with both of them. But interestingly, I was catapulted onto the international mm. talk circuit by mm. Peter Flew, mm. because I went to speak at my son's rugby dinner. And from that, the whole thing just burgeoned worldwide. And, you know, for many, probably the first two years on the talk circuit, there's one photograph where, where I'm holding my family afterwards. And every time I saw that, I just used to break down and sob. And I used to say to my audience, I'm sorry, guys, I, but it actually, it, it became such an integral part of the story. And, and my life coach said to me that the best thing that I ever did was these talks because, you know, a lot of people bottle, and this is one of my messages, people bottle their rubbish up. And when you're in stress mode and you're fighting with someone, you're emotionally scarred, so many people hold it in. I just put it out there to the world and told him my inner fears, everything that had happened to me. And that was the most cathartic thing that happened, Brett. Yeah. And I think that put me on the journey to physically, I'll never be fine. My kidneys, my pancreas, my liver, 
-hmm. We'll never recover 100% mm -hmm. the salt water and everything. But, but yeah, I mean, mentally, I think I'm probably the best I've been over the last, the first two years, mm -hmm. first year horrific, second year tough, third year on a better road. And now I, I can tell you, you know, you've read the book. I mean, I have my, my, my creed in life now is faith, family, and friends. And it's so bizarre. When those three are on sync, I was a massive businessman. All I cared about was power, money, fast cars, mm. big houses. Now I never care about anything. The, uh, faith, family, and friends. When those three are on sync and it's impossible, it's hard to get them all in sync every day of your life. But I can say on a good average that though, when those are on sync, my life is magnificent. And I, I'm so full of gratitude. And because of that gratitude, I, I experience incredible abundance, man. I have Absolutely. abundance so much of my life, in my spiritual world, in my friendships, in my family. And I'm blessed. I, I literally, I thank God. You are, day. you are most certainly. I mean, it's that place. If you come from a place of lack, you attract the same in your life. You're coming from a place of yeah. abundance. That vibrational yeah. frequency starts bending providence in your favor. And you, you were talking about faith. Brett, what, did, do you think God actually saved you on that day? I don't know if you're religious at all, um, but do you think that, do you believe in God? Do you think that God actually saved you? I have no shadow of a doubt that God saved me. And I can tell you why. I can tell you why. I mean, I had a very religious upbringing. St. Elizabeth's Church in West I was an altar boy to matric. I got bullied because of that. I, not that I hated. I played in the church band. I was part of the youth group. But I walked away from the church when I went to army. It did, did my head in so badly. But I always spoke to God. My, my church is the ocean. And I love surfing. I'm not a great surfer, but when I'm in the ocean, I feel like I've got a direct line to the boss and I talk to him and I tell him all my problems. And somehow when I'm in that ocean, life is always beautiful. And mm. I remember the first, I look God, but I told him where to get off. How could he be <laughs> to me? I haven't had a proper life yet. I'd only just been, I've only been, I'd only been married 10 years. My wife is my best friend. She's my soulmate. My kids were nine and six. I was God. And my little guy, he, he just, he's, he's a fighter of note, but he'd had a rough, rough start in life. He had a heart problem. And I remember just saying, God, you got to sort this out, bro. You're not, you're not taking me now. I'm not ready. My son needs, needs a dad. My, fa my family needs, a, needs their dad and husband. So you're going to get me through this, bro. I don't know how, but you're going to get through it. And I flocked him. I cursed him. Every time I was ready to give up, I got clapped. Amazing. Something happened, and I know it was him. He, I was saying, take me now, I'm ready. And he'd say, get a seagull to pick your eye. You tuned me, he didn't want to go now. You're not going, keep fighting. So I, I, I just believe. I know <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I always think the universe is working with you and not against you under every single circumstance. That's my motto too. But Brett, just to bring us to the end, this is your message for people listening to that. You've already given one and I'm going to repeat it and, and, uh, and see how accurate I am. But, but th that's what you share in life, right? You went on the circuit, you shared your story, doesn't own you anymore. If you keep it inside, the story owns you for the rest of your life. And you sharing with people that are going through trauma or anything like that, the best thing is to get it out of you. Express it. Share it. Right? Um, because then you own it. It doesn't own you. And so, Brett, thank you for that profound message. I really appreciate it. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, lots of love. Big love to you, champ. You're making a ripple effect of motivation and love uh, across the world. May you continue and may you continue to be blessed. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Brett. And yeah, to anybody that listens to this, just believe. If you put it out there, the world, and as Brett said, the universe is there to help us, not fight us. Mm -hmm. So if you put it out there, if you don't put it out there, no one knows about it. Get it out there. Get it off your chest. Mm -hmm. And you own it. Don't let it own you. For 100%. sure. For sure. Peace and love, brother. Thank you. Cheers Namaste. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brett. I hope that you are absolutely enjoying the Brett Shuttleworth Show, but please help me create a ripple effect of love across this globe by subscribing to my YouTube channel. You can also 
catch us on Spotify and iTunes. Let's make this world a better place for all of us. Namaste and thank you once again.